one of the things we want to talk about is um, variants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've heard all these different variants, uh, you know, the different ones that are popping up. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, so right now we are seeing a surge in um, COVID because of the BA4 and BA5 um, subvariants of Omicron. And what you should know about these variants is they are just so much more contagious than the than the original strain and even than the original Omicron um, variant. So we're looking at virus that is that is so contagious, so transmissible. And, you know, probably in your own life, you know, several people who have COVID right now. I know that I do. I have several friends and colleagues that, you know, are out with COVID. And we're seeing that because these variants are so transmissible. Um, the other thing I would say about BA4 and BA5, what makes them a little bit different is that they have what's called um, immune evasion. So although the vaccines still provide um, protection against severe disease and hospitalization, um, they don't provide as good a protection just against infection. So even those individuals who are fully vaccinated and boosted are getting infected. And additionally, if you've previously been infected with COVID. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing reinfections uh, with with this BA4 and BA5. Even if you had Omicron back in like January, February, March, you know, unfortunately, that doesn't provide protection with with these new sub variants. So are we seeing um, any more hospitalizations? Yeah, I mean, so the hospitalization levels are nowhere near where they were back with the original Omicron um, surge back in, you know, the winter, January, February. But um, sorry, my pager just keeps going on and on. Um, so the hospitalizations are nowhere near what they were back in January, February with the original Omicron. But we are seeing an uptick in hospitalizations right now. I think yesterday OHA released data that hospitalizations are kind of in the 420 range. And here at Kaiser Permanente, we have seen that uh, within our own hospitals, an uptick in, in the number of patients being admitted with COVID. So not nearly as bad as what it was, but I think higher than we expected um, to be at right now um, before we knew that these, these variants would kind of take over. All right, let's um, talk about some real practical advice here. Sure. So what happens if somebody watching this in the next couple of days, mm -hmm. starts feeling bad, they go to the rapid test, mm -hmm. and then they get those double lines that say that they're positive. Um, what kind of care should they give themselves and what kind of things should they be thinking about? Yeah, so first of all, I would say if you have a home antigen test and it turns positive, that's a true positive, so you have COVID. The other thing I would say is that if you're symptomatic and you have a home antigen test that's negative, that doesn't mean that you don't have COVID. And I would repeat that test uh, within a couple of days because we know that the sensitivity of those tests are, are increased if done sequentially. But now you have your true positive COVID test and you have COVID and you're home. And so um, the first thing you need to do is, is stay at home. You don't wanna spread this around the community. So you're staying at home and you're isolating. For individuals who are elderly, immunocompromised or have underlying medical conditions, um, we do have several um, treatments that are available potentially for those people. So if you are one of those individuals with underlying medical conditions or have um, immune compromise on chemotherapy, you should reach out to your provider to see if you qualify for an antiviral treatment because that can reduce your risk of severe disease and hospitalization. Speaking of something like Paxlovid? Exactly. Paxlovid, um, which is you know the, the predominant medication that's being used, it's an oral antiviral pill. But even if you don't qualify for Paxlovid due to, you know, drug interactions, um, there are other therapies um, that are that, that can be prescribed, such as um, what's called monoclonal antibodies and even other antivirals. So there are options for those highest risk individuals or the elderly. And I would, I would really remind people that it's important that if you're infected to reach out to your provider early because we need to start those therapies early. If you are kind of like, you know, not high risk, average person, no, no major medical problems. It's really going to be a lot of what we call supportive care at home. So, you know, stay home, don't, don't go out and infect, you know, the rest of the community. And for most individuals who are vaccinated and boosted, they're going to have what we call mild disease. But I guess I want to re- 
frame it because people think mild disease is like a drippy nose. And what we're hearing anecdotally with these variants is, you know, mild disease is you're not in the hospital, but you still feel pretty terrible, really sore throat, fevers, muscle aches, cough, headache, people don't feel good. So mild enough that you don't have to go to the hospital, which is great, but you don't feel good. Um, so those are some of the starting points for if, if you get that positive COVID test. And then how should you treat yourself if you're, you're in that range where you're normally healthy, you know, you feel like you have pretty good health. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of just the same as a cold or flu, drink a lot of fluids, that kind of thing or what? Yeah. So if you are pretty healthy, you don't have underlying medical conditions, it really is that like stay home, take care of yourself, supportive care. Um, and I would say, you know, for the most part, people will do well, but if you start developing symptoms that seem unusual for you, like really short of breath or chest pain, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to your provider. Um, so most people will do well at home, but if you have symptoms that seem really unusual, it's, it's um, reasonable to call your provider and, and ask um, about, you know, questions. Okay. Um, what about the test itself? So uh, how accurate is it just real quickly? And, you know, when can you get out of uh, isolation uh, or yeah. quarantine or whatever they call it? When, when can you leave the house when it tests clear or, or what? So when, when you refer to the test, I just want to clarify that we're referring to the, the home antigen, antigen yes. test. Because um, yes. there's a difference between the home antigen test and the PCR test that you get, you know, in a healthcare system. So the home antigen tests, um, they are helpful. They're better if you sequentially, I would say, um, you know, an, a single home antigen test is kind of like a flip of the coin as to whether or not it'll be positive, even if you have COVID. So one negative home antigen test is, is helpful, but it, it truly doesn't rule anything out and they're used best sequentially. So the whole discussion of, you know, when can you get out of isolation? And, and I'm going to be honest, that's a little bit controversial. So CDC guidance is that if you feel well, um, by day five, you can leave isolation, you leave your home, but you must wear a mask up to day 10. Um, and that's for the general population, not for immunocompromised individuals. However, they also provide guidance that if you have access to home antigen tests, you can retest um, at day five. And if you're still testing positive, you should remain on isolation for an additional five days. A lot of experts, you know, feel pretty strongly that we know many people are still shedding active virus between day six and 10. And so that discussion of, you know, should an individual who just had COVID be out and about in the community at day five, you know, th there's some controversy about that guidance. Um, and I would say if you have access to a home antigen test and you're still testing positive, um, it's reasonable as, as recommended by the CDC to stay home an additional uh, five days. But yeah, it's, it's an area of discussion, active discussion. Okay. Um, and finally, I mean, is there, I, I know this is probably beyond your reach here, but I mean, is there any end in sight to this? I mean, I'm hearing now what of another variant that's like 275 or something like that, that's <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're saying, could it be even worse? Uh, is this, this just keeps going and going? Yeah, I think we never expected to be here when this started two years ago. Um, you know, is there a, an end in sight? I think COVID is with us and here to stay um, and will be a virus that we continue to manage and deal with and learn to live with and, and learn to understand the risks um, of the virus and how to best manage it, but also go on living our lives. Uh, you know, in terms of what the future brings after July, August, gosh, I don't know. I wish I could tell you. I, I think it's anyone's best guess, but I do think that we um, essentially need to expect to live with COVID for the near future and potentially kind of ongoing um, for the foreseeable far future as well. So. And doctor, finally, if, if there is good news about mm -hmm. this whole thing, I mean, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, deaths look way different two years later than they did, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would say, yes, we're dealing with this and people are getting infected, but compared to where we were two years ago, we have so many more tools to, you know, prevent and treat um, infection if you get it. And so, yeah, it's too bad people are getting COVID. Like nobody wants to have it, but we're so much better off than where we were two years ago. So, um, you know, medicine has progressed uh, and, and we are continuing to um, have better tools. And so I, I think it's not fun to have a virus that, that's circulating, but I, the positive is that there's less suffering.
Um, okay, I, had, I lied. One more question. Okay. Weird one. What about the people who haven't gotten it yet? I mean, are they just lucky or is there, could there be something about them? Oh, like a genetic. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there, so it's an interesting question. Like we know with other viruses, there are certain genetic predispositions where like you just aren't as likely to get the virus because of some sort of, um, you know, change in your cells or, or genetic mutation. So there's probably a, a small, small subset of individuals who may, you know, have that extra protection. But I would say for the vast majority, you know, if you haven't had it yet, you will unfortunately probably get it. Um, it this current strain is like the most transmissible we've had, the most contagious, as contagious as measles. So wow. unfortunately, for most people, it's just a matter of time until you get infected. Um, that being said, you know, there are tools to help prevent infection. But I do feel like there's a little bit of inevitability there that that most of us will get infected at some point and possibly reinfected. Doctor, thanks for the update in the chat today. Thanks for all you yeah. do. Yeah, nice to meet you.